Let's do a close reading of William Wordsworth's poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, from 1815. We're not going to talk so much about the historical context here, and uh, we're not going to do critical readings in terms of literary theory, uh, but we're just going to do a close reading trying to figure out how the poem creates meaning and what kind of poetic and literary devices it uses. So let's start by first talking about the genre of this poem. And the genre is the short lyric. So a lyric is typically a fairly short poem that describes the speaker's emotions, strong emotions, uh, about something that he's passionate about. And in this case, that's nature. But it could also be something else like love, let's say. And in a lyric, we don't have too much plot normally, uh, but we have more description. Next thing we can talk about is the rhyme scheme. And the rhyme scheme is fairly straightforward. It's A, B, A, B, C, and C. And that tells you that each stanza ends with a rhyming couplet. And a rhyming couplet after the opening kind of flowing lines creates a little bit of closure at the very end. So we have some really open uh, kind of flowing lines, very natural at the beginning. And then we create a little bit more formality and uh, closure at the very end. And then we repeat the thing uh, again in the next stanza. We could talk about the meter as well. So each poem has a kind of meter. Uh, and even if it doesn't, we can give it a name. In this case, we have iambic, iambic tetrameter or tetrameter. So the word meter means rhythm. The word tetra means four. And we have four iams. And an iam is basically a pattern where you have two syllables. The first is unstressed, and the second one is stressed. And we repeat this pattern uh, four times in each poetic line. So we have, I wandered lonely as a cloud. And you can see that we have four of these iambic units. That's a bit messy, but you can sort of see it. Okay, so that's iambic tetrameter. Now, why does William Wordsworth use this? Well, these are fairly short lines, and the iambic pattern creates a fairly um, natural and flowing form. It's not harsh. Uh, it's not an unusual rhythm. It's just a very nice, easy flowing rhythm with short lines. Uh, you know, this is not iambic pentameter, which is what you would see in a sonnet. It's just something fairly short and lyrical uh, that allows the poet to express his emotions naturally. We can also talk about poetic devices in the poem. And we start with a couple of similes. So we have, I wandered lonely as a cloud. And we also have continues as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. So a couple of si uh, similes that show the poet's imagination. And he uses quite a few literary devices, in part to show the power of the imagination. He's not just describing literally what he sees, but he's describing the kind of emotional reality of what he experienced. He felt lonely as a cloud, right? The, the daffodils seemed continuous as the stars. And of course, some of that is exaggeration, and we'll get to that in a moment. The poem, however, contains actually more metaphors than similes. And the most powerful metaphor has to do with dancing. These daffodils are said to be dancing, now, Wordsworth draws attention to this in every single stanza. So the second stanza has the word dance, third stanza has danced, and the last one has dances. And you'll notice as well that each time we change the form of the word a little bit. Dances, danced, dance, and dancing. So we see this kind of poetic creativity describing the movement of these daffodils. And in fact, movement is really a powerful image in this poem. Uh, the daffodils are dancing, they're fluttering, right? They're stretching, uh, they're tossing their heads. Everything is movement in this poem. And so it's not so much just about color, you know, the golden daffodils, but it's really a flashing image uh, that, just, that just overtakes him and makes him feel something that seems quite sublime. And we'll get to this concept of the sublime in a second as well. Okay, so we have a lot of um, metaphor in this poem, and often the metaphors involve some element of what's called personification. Personification. 
Personification, you will probably remember, is where you take an inanimate object, a liveless thing, and you endow it with these kind of um, human um, characteristics. So the daffodils here seem as if they are people. They are a crowd, right? They are a host. Although the word host is often used in connection with angels as well. So the heavenly host. And that makes them seem kind of divine at the same time. Um, we, we see them fluttering and dancing. So dancing is personification. Uh, they have heads, apparently. Uh, they are described as a company. Now, why all this personification? And I think that's always the question you have to ask. You shouldn't just look for metaphors or similes and say, well, my job is done. It's a poem. Ha ha. Uh, there's always got to be some kind of function to the form, right? Form and content go together. Well, he uses personification to create this radical contrast between his own loneliness at the very beginning and at the very end, solitude at the end, and the company that he finds with the daffodils. The daffodils make him feel at home as if he has friends. And that's a weird kind of contrast because you might assume that in society he would feel at home, but that's not what happens. In society, which is really the last stanza, right, when he's at home, uh, he feels solitude. But with the daffodils, he feels a companionship, a kinship, and a friendship. That's quite startling, and he's really making a powerful point here about the, the restorative power of nature, that it can create these kinds of emotional effects. Sometimes, though, we sort of think, well, this is really hyperbole. So a lot of this is exaggeration for poetic of effect. Um, and it's not the literal reality, but I think he can get away with it because he's talking about the imagination, because he's really saying this is an emotional uh, reality, as we mentioned. The second stanza probably contains the most hyperbole, and that's because here we're moving increasingly to an aesthetic kind of description that's more sublime. And the sublime in the Romantic period is often distinguished from the, the beautiful, which is really the first stanza here, the more beautiful aspects, um, by being more full of awe, okay, more impressive, uh, maybe even kind of spine tingling, right? It sends a shiver down your spine. It's so epic. Maybe that's another good word here. It's something that is really impressive. And he creates this more sublime effect in the second stanza by really zooming out and talking about the stars as being like Oh, sorry, the daffodils as being like the stars in the galaxy. It creates this immense kind of scope to the poem. You could say, well, that's hyperbole. <laughs> you know, there, there are not as many daffodils as there are stars in the galaxy. Uh, but okay, you know, this, this is what the imagination is capable of. And you, you can see here that the poem is as much about nature as it is about our mental faculties and about the imagination. What's amazing then about this poem, as we continue, is that he still manages to pass all of this off as so natural, even after this hyperbole and over-the-top description. Um, he uses poetic form to make sure that it sounds like he's just talking to you, as if he really just saw this and he's describing it in his own words. What he uses here is something called enjambment, which is kind of a weird term, but a useful one. Because enjambment refers to when you have an idea, a thought that you want to express, and you don't stop at the end of the poetic line. There's no pause here, but you just keep going right across the line. And we, we call that continuation enjambment. You can read through the poem and just see if you can find other examples of enjambment. But the effect of this is to create a poem that really sounds natural. And modern contemporary poets use enjambment all the time because they don't want that end of the line to seem artificial. They just want to talk right across it. And Wordsworth is doing that. And in romantic poet poems, you often start to see that more and more. At the end of the third stanza, we come to the end of the first section. And there are really two sections to the poem. The first part is about being in the moment. Okay, It's about being spontaneous. It's about just letting the feelings flow over you and through you and you are carried away by it and you don't even realize how amazing this is, right? I little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. I wasn't self-conscious. 
But the final bit is a little bit more self-conscious, and that's because now we're talking about the memory of the daffodils. And at this point, um, he sees the memory multiple times. They often flash into his empty or thoughtful mood, his mind, right? Um, the inward eye hears the imagination, so he uses the imagination to bring this image back. And this second kind of moment may seem much more artificial. Uh, it seems more self-conscious. Um, it's after the, after the effect. And it's a little bit like if you go and see something amazing and you take a picture of it, and then later you look at the picture in your scrapbook or in your photo album, although most of us don't actually print out our photos anymore. Um, that second moment seems less intense. It seems like you're kind of reflecting on what you experienced before, but it's usually seen as being better when you're in the moment and actually being right there. So we, we have this contrast, but there's still an amazing amount of continuity. And what's continuous here is that the poet still feels quite passive. Okay, it's happening to him. They flash upon that inward eye. It's as if he can't help it. And the memory just comes flooding back. It's suddenly there before he can do something about it. Um, notice that surprising aspect also in the opening lines, because Wordsworth uh, writes, all at once I saw a crowd, right? All out of the blue, suddenly I noticed that this sight was there. So there's a kind of passivity to this experience. And that's important because that's what creates continuity between the two scenes. Even later on, it's not artificial, it's natural, it just happens and it, it comes upon him and he experiences this. But even though there's this continuity, I, I would say that there's this kind of theoretical question in the background. And it's a question that most Romantic poets are fascinated by. The question is this, which is better to be in the moment and spontaneous, but maybe not realize what, how amazing it was, or to recognize later how amazing it was, but not to be spontaneous? And then there's a follow-up question as well. And that follow-up question is this, if you become self-aware of the amount of enjoyment you get out of something, does that self-consciousness break the spell, right? Does it shatter the illusion? Does it take away the trance that you're in and now you're self-conscious? So is self-consciousness the enemy of true feeling or is it something that actually adds to true feeling and allows for a deeper kind of feeling? It's a question that the, the poem explores. It doesn't fully settle that or answer that question. Um, somehow the poem overcomes all of these kinds of problems that are in the background, and it simply expresses in a really profound way the following points. And I'll just summarize what we've seen then. The poem says that nature is magical, that the imagination can add to the effect without destroying it, and that the later memory may be less intense perhaps, but is still great and is still something that surprises and carries you away. So a beautiful poem. Hopefully this close reading helps you make some sense of it.